Hello and welcome to this Intro to Rails tutorial series. Uh, I'm planning on covering a few basic concepts in this series and uh, hopefully you guys will find some value out of it. In this first one we're just going to be creating a basic blog and styling it a little bit with Bootstrap. Now there's two ways to handle this. You can either style it with Bootstrap by doing, uh, in this case we'll type Rails new and then the name of our app. I'll call mine blog demo. Uh, you can do dash C space Bootstrap which will enable Bootstrap. It'll also change the configuration of your app around a little bit. So I think for the purposes of this tutorial, it's better if we don't do that. Instead, we'll just run Rails new blog demo. That'll create our basic Rails application and run all of our uh, Rails stuff in the background. Let me now come over to, um, oops, let me do this. Come over to here, create a new tab. And let's look for Bootstrap 5 CDN. Go to Introduction, uh, because we're gonna be using this in a second. We can come back to our homepage now that this is done. Clear the console with Control L, CD into our blog demo app. I already have this open in VS Code. This will refresh and we can see our application right here. So I'd like to start by generating a controller just so we have a homepage. So I'll say Rails G controller call this pages. Let me full screen this and bump it up a little bit so you can read this. Rails G controller pages, and I wanna give this two actions. One will be the home action, and another one will be the about action. You can then hit enter to generate this controller. All these actions are just pages that we can visit. So I'll minimize this, and then let's run a Rails S to start the server real quick. And then we can come into our browser and go to localhost port 3000 and we can see our default Rails page. Now to go to the pages we just generated, we have to go to slash pages slash home, and that takes us to this home page right here. Uh, now a lot just happened there. In our app views pages home.html, this is where this file is being shown from. But if I open up the web dev tools with control shift I, there's actually more to it. There's this head right here with a whole bunch of meta stuff and links and a style sheet. Now, th this doc type through body tag and these closing body tags, that comes from our app views layouts application.html.erb file. So all of this stuff right here is just our template. And this yield tag, when, it, when Rails reaches this yield tag, it then replaces this with whatever the route is. So in this case, the route is slash pages slash home. So Rails says, okay, go to app, views, pages, home, and put whatever is in here in where this yield tag is. So I could actually just replace this with our hard-coded stuff and nothing would change here. So that's pretty neat. But of course, now that I've done that, if I go to slash about, it'll still say pages home. So we don't want that, we want it to be dynamic. So now if it just says yield, it'll yield whatever's in the about page, which just says pages about. So that's pretty neat. It's also very powerful for um, making dynamic content. But okay, I wanna go back to the home page real quick. I would like this home page to show when I go to localhost port 3000. How do we do that? Well, we can go into config and routes.rb. And in here, we at the bottom, you can see it even it says, oops, let me move this over. It says that you can define the root path to be whatever this is. So if we get rid of this, we can then say the root is the posts, or sorry, the pages controller and the home action. So instead of a slash, it's a hash, which is how I remember this. Uh, and all this tells it is that it needs to go into the pages controller, look for a home action. So what is a home action? Well, if I go into the explorer, scroll up, inside of app controllers, pages controller, you can see that the class pages controller has two methods in it. One is home, one is about. So when I go to the root path now, it goes to the home action. It sees there's nothing to do in here. And then it says, okay, that's the home action in the pages controller. So then I have to show this HTML. So now if I go to the root path, it's the home page. 
And if I go to slash pages slash home, it's also the home page. If we don't want that to happen, maybe you want just uh, get home to work. We then have to tell it where get home points to. If it's in the format of like pages slash home, Rails is smart enough to figure out that means point it to home uh, hash index. But if it's just the word home, that could mean a lot of things. So there we have to explicitly say this points to here. But now if I go to slash pages slash home, that no longer exists. Now, of course, it doesn't make sense really to have like a home page at this slash home. So uh, this actually needs to be pages and home. GitHub Copilot was stealing the code from the wrong repository. And this needs to be pages. I'm now the one that's guilty of not paying enough attention. So if we mash the refresh button, it'll work now. It doesn't make sense to have a slash home. So let's just get rid of this. And instead, let's change this pages slash about to be to the pages hash about. Save that. Refresh. Actually, let's go back to the root path. And now if we go to slash about, that's now the about page. What's great about Rails is because we just did all of that, I can actually stop this, hit F11, clear this. You can type Rails routes in your terminal. And if I zoom out a couple steps, it'll clean this up a bit. Couple more steps. What this does is it prints out all of the routes in your application. So here I can see that I have an about route, a root route, and then a whole bunch of stuff that I just really don't care about because it's stuff that Rails is generating for me. These two I do care about. And what this means is when you want to link to a specific route, you have a prefix and a suffix. It shows you the prefix, which is about, and your suffix is just underscore path. So if I want to link to the about path, I have to do about underscore path as my variable. And we can take a look at this real quick. I can open up Rails C. I can just say, like, if I want to show the about path, I have to do about underscore path. This isn't going to work here because some of these variables only work in certain areas, right? Like I can do, uh, I don't know, test equals four and then print out test. But I can't do about underscore path because I don't know where I'm getting them from. So that's something to keep in mind is sometimes these, these things won't work. But if you wanted to print out the about path and you imported it properly, then this is where you would get it from. Now to exit this, we can type exit or we can hit control D, control L to clear and then Rails S to start the server and then I'll hit F11 to unminimize my terminal and refresh. Now let's take a look at linking between the home page and this about page. So we'll come into our app, views, pages, home. And there's two ways to do it. Of course, we can create an A tag with an href equal to slash about uh, about me slash a save that. And this is just basic HTML. This will of course work, but if I come into my routes and I change this to be, uh, get pages slash about again, and I refresh, this doesn't work. So now I have to go to slash pages slash about this works. But if we go back to our homepage, we now need to update this link. That's bad. That's a code smell. Don't do that. That, that's just recipe for maintainability problems. Instead, it'd be nice if we could use a variable. This same link is the same thing as saying link to, and this is inside of some Ruby code, and I'll explain this in a minute as well. So link to, then whatever you wanna call the link. So I'll say about me, myself, and I, comma, and then wherever you wanna go. And here we actually have these route helpers. So I can type about underscore path, save this, refresh. And I no longer have an about path because I just changed it to be uh, about pages path, I think, right? Or about, let's see, about pages path. It might be pages about path based on how I did that, yeah. So I used the wrong path here. Uh, it tells, about, tells me undefined local variable or method about pages path. And most people take this go over to Google, search it, try and figure out what the issue is. 
Best tip I could ever give you is to read the second line of your error because most of the time it, it'll literally tell you what you meant. So here it's like, did you mean this? Pages about path, which yes, I did. So if I paste that in here, save it, refresh, this now works. So the about me still doesn't work because our, our route changed, but our pages about now works. And this is really, really good because I can change this to be get about, I can change this to be just the about path, and we're good. And I understand in this case, it's very minor because it's the difference between adding pages to this and changing what this href is. But the key here is that you aren't formatting the URL. You're just changing what the variable name is. So like if this turns into slash pages, slash about, slash Dean, slash profile, slash uh, colon ID, and then question mark, I don't know, date of birth plus social security number or something, you don't wanna have to go through and change all of that to create these links because that's just a nightmare. What you can instead do is just change this to be like, I don't know, uh, share Dean's info path and you're done, which is a lot easier to deal with. But okay, we'll, we'll get rid of that because we have our special link here and we'll save this. And I'll actually grab this and let's change this to be just about me. I'm gonna copy this and then we'll refresh this page. So now we have the about me link, which takes us to the about page. So let's open up our Explorer, go over to uh, views, pages about, and here I'm gonna paste in that link and I'm gonna change this to be back to home. And because we changed this to be a root path, we just have to put the word root path here. You can save this, refresh, go back to home. This is really nice because if we ever change our root path, maybe we make it like um, the index page for our blog, for example, we don't have to go through and change wherever that is. We just leave this as root path and we're done because we just changed the variable. But okay, now we can go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And you can see down here that we're basically DOSing our application by doing this, but it still works just fine. That's really neat. Huge fan of that, A+. I'd now like to uh, maybe, let's start by just doing a git commit. So let's do a git status to check what we have. We added some stuff. Let's do a git add dot to add it all. We can then run a git status again, see what we did. Git commit dash M and let's say this is the init commit and then we'll do a git push. Now we don't have a place to push to so let's go handle that real quick. So let's open up GitHub. I'll be using GitHub for this. You don't have to follow along with this. This is just to get you familiar with this, no pun intended. I'll call this, I don't know, blog um, application. Sure, why not? Save this, we'll click create repository. It'll just create an empty repository for us. And we have two options here. Now I already have my SSH set up. You can use HTTPS, which will just, uh, you'll use this link and then it will ask you to log in. I have mine set up to automatically log me in. So I'll just do this. I'll just click copy paste the whole thing in and I'll type git push and then it'll push this up to GitHub for me. I can come up here, refresh, and now I have all of my code safe and sound on a remote repository. So let's now come back to our blog. I'll clear the console and let's maybe style it. So let's say git checkout dash B and I wanna call this styling branch. So we're now on a branch called styling. I want to add Bootstrap to my application. So let's come over to our Explorer. Let's go to our template because I want this to apply to every page, not just one page. And let's grab this CDN from Bootstrap 5. So if we go to Google, search for Bootstrap 5 CDN, you can probably look at my search history and see that I was probably trying to center a div or something. And then right here, we can just paste in this entire CDN, save it. We don't really need to think about it. And then let's start our server again. Refresh and hopefully we'll see, yep, some things changed. And now we can actually just grab, um, let's, let's maybe start here. Let's create a main tag. 
wrap around the yield. This is just good practice. It won't change anything. But now let's go into our home page and let's maybe say this needs to all be inside of a div container or a div with a class equal to container, which will center it. Uh, and then maybe I want to create a nav bar. That sounds like it would be cool. So let's go over to components and nav bar. And we're just going to grab the first one we see, which is this one, which has a search bar. Now, of course, the search bar won't work, uh, but that's fine. Let's go into our uh, views layouts, create a new file, call this underscore nav And this underscore is just telling Rails that this is a partial. And I'll explain that right now. So inside of our application.html.erb, ideally we would want our nav bar to be uh, displayed on every page. So we could just paste this entire thing in, uh, control S to save, refresh, and now I have a working nav bar. Cool, none of these links work yet, but you get the idea, I can't even search. Problem is we've now flooded our application with a whole bunch of stuff that we just don't care about. So let's undo that. And instead, we can create this thing called a partial where we paste in our code. And then if we refresh, our nav bar is gone, but we can render this partial by going in application.html.erb. And then maybe we want to uh, just render a partial, which is inside of our layouts folder in our views slash nav bar. And Rails knows this is a partial, so you don't need the underscore here, even though we named the file that. But if we save this, refresh, we now have our nav bar back. You can, of course, leave this in your main or leave this out of your main, depending on how you want to do it. But let's now come into our home page. And in here, I would like to maybe uh, put this inside of a jumbotron of some sort. So let's say we have our container. Let's do a dot jumbotron. I don't actually know if this is still a thing in Rails. I think it goes like this maybe. Uh, looks like it's not. I'm not entirely sure. That's fine though. So instead, let's just change this to be uh, my blog or my personal home page. And then maybe just a bit like a bit of a blurb. You can read more about me or check out my blog. And that's just a very basic setup there. So we can, of course, come in here and mess with these nav bar links. Uh, that would also be good. We can come into our nav bar partial. And this is why I like it because you just it's one file that you search for. If I ever want to come into my nav bar, I hit control P, type nav bar, hit enter, and I can just come right to my nav bar. Otherwise, I'd have to do like application.html.erb, come in here and go find it. Same thing, but this way just feels a bit cleaner to me. Uh, maybe I want this to not say nav bar. Maybe I want this to say, I don't know, Rails blog because we're, we're making a Rails blog. That seems cool, but now I want to change the link. And I've learned from Dean that link twos are better than hrefs. No problem. We can just do a link to the uh, Rails blog, comma, root underscore path, comma, class, colon. And then we'll just paste in whatever this class is right here. Now let's get rid of this A link right here. And now we just have a Rails link. Works the same way, but we can go home with it. So if I go to the About page, I can go home. So that's pretty cool. Uh, let me actually zoom out a bit so that we get a regular nav bar to work with. Now this home link we can keep. We don't need it to be active. Let me do this. And let's get rid of the rest of this for now because we don't actually need this. Let's leave the drop down, but we'll get rid of um, the disabled link and this form. So we'll do this and we'll save, refresh. And now we have a couple links here. So we have our home and our link. I'd like this home to be a link to the root path again. 
I'm gonna grab this Rails blog from up here, paste it in, format it, and then I'll change this to just say home. And this isn't a nav bar, this is now a nav dash link. And then we can get rid of this A right here. I'll now copy this and paste it down here. And I'll change this to be the about path. If we refresh, uh, I've now, oops, I forgot to change this to be about. There we go. So we now have a home, about, and our brand. And we have this drop down. The drop down isn't set up yet, but we can work on that in a second here. So we can actually take this. Uh, let's grab this li right here with the drop down in it. Below our UL, we'll create another UL. Close the UL, and then we'll paste in this drop down, just like that. Save it, and we actually need to give this UL a navbar dash nav class. So we'll say class equal to navbar dash nav. Save this, refresh, and now on the right side we have a drop down, which in the future we could use for like our user account to drop down and, and log in, log out, all that other stuff. But I think this is pretty good starting point for a Rails blog. Now I'll leave you with uh, creating an actual blog post and then you can figure out how you would add a link to that blog post. So we're gonna stop the server and we'll actually do, we'll, we'll add our changes to our main branch. So we'll say git status, git add dot, git commit dash m, add styling, git push. And then it's gonna tell us we need to set an upstream. So I'll copy this, paste, hit enter. And then we can come to our actual remote repository where it says styling had recent pushes. I'll say create a pull request and I'll full screen it. Change the pull request to say add styling, no unit tests for this because I'm a uh, messy coder. Create a pull request. It'll run checks. You can have this run like unit tests automatically and all that other stuff, of course. Now let's go over to the files changed and we're going to scroll through this. We'll see all of the stuff we changed with this pull request. This looks good to me. So I'll click review changes. Looks good to me. And then I'll hit submit review. So we've now reviewed our pull request. It's a little weird that we're reviewing our own pull request, but that's fine. And now I'll hit merge pull request. Confirm the merge code is now merged, we can now delete this branch. So let me click delete branch. And now we're back to only having one branch. That's good. So let's do git checkout main. So we're now on the main branch, your branch is up to date with origin main. Let's try a git fetch to see if that's true. Looks like it isn't. So if I do get status, your branch is behind origin main by two commits. And that's because we have our uh, commits that we pushed up and then our commit from merging. So let's do a get pull to pull these changes. Cool. Now let's do a get checkout dash B add uh, blog posts. Uh, let's actually do add blog posts like that. Now we're on another new branch and we have uh, time to create our blog post real fast. And I know what you're thinking. It better not be hard coded. Uh, you just said real fast though, so I'm a little bit confused. Well, thankfully we're using Rails. So this part is actually one of the fastest steps we can do. You can just type Rails G scaffold post, which is what we're gonna call our blog posts. We'll give each one a title uh, and then we'll give it a body of type text. Now the title is actually set to be a string by default, but the uh, Rails scaffold generator is smart enough to know that if you don't add in anything, it's just of type string. The body, however, because we need it to be bigger than just a string, we have to specify colon text. And now we can actually hit enter. It'll generate the scaffold with a whole bunch of stuff for us, but 
one of the things that we want to look at is it generated I come into the DB folder, migrate, and this first file generated a migration with the timestamp and called it create posts. And here it's just modifying the database to say a title is of type string and a body is of type text and also create some timestamps. So if we come back to our terminal, we can run rails space DB colon migrate to migrate the database, which just creates these tables for us in our database. So now if we type Rails C to open up our Rails console, I can do capital P post dot new, which will create a new post for me. And this might be formatted a little bit differently for you, but it's similar uh, enough. So if I do this again, let me clear this. There we go. So it says post right here with our memory address. It has an ID of nil, a title of nil, a body of nil, a created at of nil and an updated at of nil. And we can create a post here in two different ways. We can either go to our website or we can create it through the console. I'd like to start by creating it through the console, give you a bit more of an appreciation for what the app does for us. So we can do post.create or we can do post.new. Let's do post.new uh, first. So I'll say at post equals post.new. And then I need to pass in some stuff. I want it to have a title. So I'll say title, colon, whatever I want to call it. So I'll say hello world, comma, a body, quotes. Um, this is my first post. And the created at and the updated at are actually set automatically. Same with the ID. So I can actually close this. This is our entire statement here. So if I run this, this creates our post. I can now type at post because it's just our variable name. You can see here the ID is nil, created at and updated are still nil. And the reason is we haven't saved our post. We've only made a new one. So if I now do at post.save, oops, at post.save, you can see it begins a transaction, inserts into post the title body created at, updated at. And of course, these are generated uh, when you run it. So in here, you can see it's setting the title to be hello world, the body to be this is my first post, created at to be whatever time this is, and the updated at to be whatever time this is. Now there is some setup you have to do to change this time to be uh, correct in terms of time zones. We're not gonna cover that right now, but that's one way to create a post. Instead of doing at post.new and then doing save, you can also do post dot create and we'll change the title to be I don't know my second post and then we'll say this is my second post I'll hit enter and it'll just insert it into that and it'll do the same thing this has an ID of two now let's say I want to grab one of these posts so I can say uh, at post equals post dot find the one with an ID of one so now I say at post.title, that's our first post. You can also do at post equals capital P post.first. That also gives us the first post. Um, I can do at post equals find, oops, equals post.find2. That gives us the second post or the last post that we made, post.title. What else I can do is I can say at post equals capital P post dot last, and that'll give us the last post. Uh, I can also do at post equals post dot last parentheses two. And then if I do at post, that gives us the last two posts that were created. Just all very helpful methods that you can do. And of course, all of this works inside of your Rails app. You just have to figure out where in the app to do this. But okay, we did all of that. Let's now exit out of here. Let's hit Control D, or we can just type exit inside of our Rails console. So I can also type exit and it'll exit. And now I would like to, oops, I would like to start the server. So say Rails S. Um, actually, let me clear this because it's a little bit buggy. Type Rails S. Let me refresh the page. So when we generated that scaffold, it did a lot for us. Obviously it just did everything I just showed you, but it did some other stuff too. 
So the first thing it did was in our app, we now have a controller post controller. If we open this, I'll full screen this, it created this post controller with a, a whole bunch of different actions. So in the same way that our pages controller had a home action and an about action, which let us go to pages slash home and pages slash about, this created a post slash index, a post slash show, which actually sends you to slash post slash one, a, a post slash new, an edit for the post. So this is where you go to edit a page, a place where you go to create the post, which you can see here, it does the at post equals post dot new. It passes in some parameters, which is we'll cover in a second. And then it says, if you could save the post, then send the user to the post and tell them the post was created. Uh, if you couldn't save the post, then render new again, which is our new page, and tell it that there was an error. Uh, we also have a destroy page. So if you want to delete a post, that's also here. And then down here, we have private methods. One is to set the post which is uh, just trying to find a post based on the parameters that are in the URL that are being passed. Uh, we'll cover that in, in a little bit, maybe in the next video. And then the post parameters are when I create a new post, uh, I could theoretically inject a whole bunch of garbage. What post params does is it just says that the params require the post and it only allows the title and the body. So like if I tried to put something in here that said like Dean's address as like another parameter and it wasn't permitted. So like our params had a Dean's address or something. This, this wouldn't get through our permitted parameters. So it's just a way to sort of deny list uh, parameters, or I guess allow list parameters so that uh, not everything gets into your application. Oops. So this, uh, set post and post params. They're actually used throughout the application. So you can see here, when we try to update a post, we're actually updating based on the parameters that Rails was sent. So depending on how the pages are constructed, you'll have like a post title and a post body and a post ID sent through the parameters. It'll then try to update those. So it'll try to do something like post.update where the ID is equal to params colon ID. The title is now equal to params title. And the body is now equal to params, oops, params body. So it's essentially doing this, but inside of here with this little helper method. So that's really neat. You won't always have to hard code these things or you won't have to code them yourselves. Sometimes a scaffold generator doing this is all you'll need for like a basic CRUD app. But of course, if I'm, I don't know, trying to uh, maybe give each post a, a user and assign it to a user, or maybe I wanna be able to like assign posts to other users, or like maybe you have a homework model. You wanna assign the, the, a piece of homework to a specific user you would then say something like user.homework equals homework.find, uh, I don't know, ID 53 or something. So you can do that in here as well. It's just sometimes having your parameters in this little helper function saves you a lot of trouble. But in this case, this is fine. So that's our post controller. Now we also have our views, which is a folder full of views, which has a whole bunch of pages built for us. We also have our post model, and we'll take a look at these pages in a second. And then the post model is just a, an empty class, but in here you can actually do all sorts of stuff. Like I can validate um, my title to have a presence of true and a length of minimum of five characters and a maximum of 50. And I can like, I don't know, def uh, on create. I can say, go to the database and uh, post dot destroy all. So I can like destroy all posts when I create a new post. And then I can say like, uh, after create, destroy all posts. 
So there's a whole bunch of logic in here. And this the whole point of this model view controller architecture is that in the model, you do your database uh, connections. So this is where you actually will destroy your post. But OK, we're not, we're not actually doing that right now. We're also not validating a title. We'll just leave this blank. In our actual posts, it's probably easier if I just start the server to show you. So if we come over to slash posts, which is our index action, you'll see that the posts we created already exist here. You'll also see that we have all of our posts being shown on one page. This is the index action in our post controller, which is calling at posts equals post.all. If I come into our views posts index.html.erb, you'll see there's a notice up here, which we don't actually need. Uh, with an H1, actually, let me leave it there. It's better if I leave it there. I know that I don't like it, but it might be helpful. Um, we have our uh, title of this page. We then have an ID of posts. And then from our at post that again, we're creating in our post controller, we're calling dot each do post. And then just like we were rendering a partial for our, our uh, nav bar, here it's rendering this model as a partial, which is a bit more Rails magic, but basically it's rendering us, uh, what is it? It's like posts slash underscore post. So it's the same thing as doing this or like with the underscore, but you, you don't put the underscore there. It's just a little bit of Rails magic to be a bit of a helper there. And then it has the link to our show this post and a link to the new post. So if I click on show this post, we go to localhost slash post slash one, which in our post controller is just the show method, which has a before action that sets the post only if it's the show, edit, update, or destroy. So let's see what set post does in here. It says at post equals post dot find params ID. This is the ID. So it's the same thing as typing post find one and setting that to at post. Okay, so all of that is the show. What about the actual show page? Well, in the actual show page, this is just doing another notice. It's rendering this post. So this is gonna be another post partial. Um, and then in here, we have the edit this post with an edit post path back to posts, which is just your posts index. So it's all of your posts. So that's what your posts path is. If you wanna to link to that, like let's say you wanted to put something up in the nav bar, you'd probably need to use your post path. And then we have a button to destroy this post with an at post with a method of delete. Now, if you're ever deleting something or you're trying to sign out, you need to use a button to, and you need to give it a comma method delete afterwards. That's just some quirks with Rails. Uh, if you don't have that, and let's say I create another test post right here. If I try to delete this without the method delete or the button to, I'm willing to bet I'll get an error here. So let me click destroy this post. And actually I don't get an error, but like nothing happens. So if I leave this as a button to, and I refresh, still nothing happens. If I bring back the method to, and I click delete this post, now we can see started delete for posts and then delete from posts where posts ID equals ID three. The whole point behind that is because you are using not a get request, you're using a delete request. You need to be very specific. You want to stop it so that like if a search engine comes through, they don't just click on all these buttons and cause a whole bunch of drama, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just there to help you, but it is a bit annoying that you have to set it up this way. But okay, that's now our show page. What about this render at post? Well, that's actually your underscore post now. I guess they changed this in Rails 7. So your show page is now what happens in your index page when it says um, render post. This actually takes you to, or I'm sorry, your show page has a show with a render post now, which is the same thing as your index render post, which are both your underscore post.html.erp. Confusing, but what that means is instead of having to edit both of these at the same time, I could, I could separate them and make them 
uh, distinct. But this way I can say, I don't want this to say title. It's implied that it's a title. And for the body, I want this to be in a div and not a P tag. And I don't want it to say body anymore. And if I save this, that change happens to both of these pages, not just one of them. So I can like H1 this slash H1. And this is really good because it's it's just a single point of change now. I mean, that's always lovely when you can just change one thing and have it apply to multiple pages. So like here, our div of ID of post, I like, can also give this a style or a class equal to container. Uh, actually, nope, I don't want to do that. I want to come up here. So I'll say dot container like that. Center that is just driving me a little bit nuts. And maybe we want the actual post. Maybe uh, H1 is too big. Let's do a H2 instead. Save this. Refresh. How's it looking here? It also looks good in here. So you can see that's it's a really handy way to sort of make a single point of change. Uh, you can also come into like your edit page. So if I want to edit this post, this is going to send me to the edit page that will then render the form and pass in the form as a local variable. So I can then come into underscore form and in here it's got a whole bunch of stuff, but basically if there's any errors, it'll tell me. And then it generates the title label right here, the title text field, and the uh, text body or text area for the body. It then creates the update post. And this is really nice because it does this form in both the edit page as well as the new page. So in both of those, you can set the title of the actual page, but you can edit the form in just one place and it'll work in both. And uh, I guess we can show what an error looks like here if I come into the post model. And if we wanted to uh, add in this validation again, which I'll just show you real quick, which says validates the colon title, comma, presence true, which means you have to have a title. And then a length where a minimum is five characters and a maximum is 50 characters. Uh, we can then also validate, oops, validate the body in the same way with a presence of true, a length a minimum of 10 and a maximum of 100. So we'll save this. So now if I try to create a new post, let me go back to the uh, all post page, oops, and click new post. If I try to create a new post now, we actually get errors in the page for us. So title can't be blank, body can't be blank. So if I just do some testing here, now it tells me the body can't be blank. And now it's telling me the body's too short. Now it's telling me the title can't be blank. The title's too short. And now it finally lets me post it, but we don't want that, so I'll just destroy it. So I think that's about it for all of these uh, post HTML ERBs. But there's one other thing I'd like to show you because the world of APIs is vast and scary but one thing that makes this a lot easier is that, as you've probably noticed, every one of these methods in your generated scaffold controller, your post controller, has a format.html. It also has a format.json, which means I can call .json on any of these, and it'll return just a JSON string, which I can then use to power an API to uh, display this. So let's say I have a React application that needs to grab some post data. I can make a request from the command line or from the React app with like Axios, request this data from the JSON, and then I can use both the HTML version of my website and this API version at once. Uh, and this was all created for me with very little effort on my part. So that's sort of the power behind having uh, the scaffold generator. And as you use more of Rails, you, you become more familiar with how to create some of the stuff. Like some of it I still have to look up, uh, but other stuff I don't have to. Like if I come in here by now, I'm pretty comfortable creating most of the basic CRUD apps. 
most of the time this part right here is like magic to me so you'll probably just find me doing something like at post.save and then i hope it works uh, unless i'm doing like an actual application then i might <laughs> i might do it properly but if i'm just hacking something together for a tutorial a lot of times like i'm comfortable enough to call at post.save or at post.update but those are just things you get used to over time as far as what you need to actually edit your going to spend a lot of your time in your controllers, your model, your views. You'll come into your config occasionally, like for your routes, where we're defining this resources post and the rest of our pages. Uh, and you might maybe come into your DB your migrate to change some stuff in here. Uh, but aside from that, then your gem file, like that's it. A lot of these folders, they seem scary at first, but you you really don't need to go in there initially. Down the line, you might find reasons to do it. Like um, I can just show you right now, a really popular one is if you're creating test data, let me do a rails db colon drop, rails db colon migrate, and then a rails s. So let's say I wanna go to slash posts and when I get here, I'd like to have maybe five posts by default. It gets really annoying to have to do that after you drop your database and your development environment. So you can come into your seeds.rb inside of your database folder. And here you can just say, I want to, um, let's say 10 dot times do X. And so this is just gonna do whatever's in here 10 times. I wanna say post.create. Give it a title of, uh, sure, why not? Title of this with a number and a body of X uh, words go here. I don't know. I don't know, man. So if I do this and I save this, I'll stop the server. We can now run a Rails DB colon seed command. Assuming I did that right. And I can do a Rails S to start the server, refresh. You can see here, we've now created 10 distinct posts that are of course <laughs> zero based uh, as is tradition off by one error. Um, but this is a really good way to like get the, your database up and running if you need to. Uh, but like, you, you know, your schema.rb, you're probably not gonna come in here too much because you'll be working on an app where you're pretty familiar with your schema uh, until you get to like an enterprise type application. And that's what I like, at least when you're learning, is you have like your points of focus. And until you actually come across some code that uses helpers or you start learning what helpers are, you don't really come in here. Uh, your jobs, you also won't come in here. You might come into your JavaScript folder, of course, but you can really narrow down what area your focus is on. And I think that's really, really helpful. And as far as what we're gonna be covering in the next tutorial, uh, because this one covered the posts a little bit. In, in between, I'd like you to try to maybe create a link to this post page here when you're on the home page, in the same way we did the home and the about. Maybe try going to this post page that is showing the uh, index action, right? So try linking to here. That would be good. And then in the next video, we'll cover a bit more with uh, using the CRUD apps. I'd like to add a view counter. Maybe we can do some like, uh, maybe we can look at user accounts. That might be a good one and do like emails and stuff. Uh, but for now, let's go ahead and add what we did here. So I'll say git add dot, git commit dash M. Uh, and this was doing the adding the posts, right? Do a git push. Come over to our, oops, let me add the upstream. Come over to our GitHub repo again, do another pull request, add the posts, create the pull requests. Uh, you don't have to review the changes. I just like doing it because it makes it feel like I did work some, or like I did some work today. Submit review. And then I can merge the pull request. Confirm. Delete the branch. Come back over to our blog application. This is looking good. You can also fill out the readme if you want to. And then down here, I will do a git pull. 
and get check uh, oops get checkout main get status I guess I have to do another git pull once I'm in main branch there we go and now this, this branch is up to date so in the next video we'll cover some more of those changes but for now thank you for watching and I hope this was helpful if you have any questions feel free to leave them in the comments down below or you can check the pinned comment for a discord server where a whole bunch of people will be happy to help you get started with rails it's a whole wonderful community of very helpful people that usually help me make these tutorials as well but thank you for watching and i will see you in the next video